graduated from Brockton High School and went on to Boston College and worked for 14 years for the Boston Herald and he was at Ground Zero. Uh, he covered the station. He also covered the administrations of uh, Governor Weld and Governor Patrick and, and of course Mayor Menino who is the uh, longest serving mayor in the city of Boston. So we have a real expert on Boston events He's been on Fox News, let me see, CBS Early Show, CNN, MSNBC, and I can only say that if I read it because I could get that one backwards, um, E! True Hollywood Stories, WGBH, CNBC. Well, a pretty impressive array of, uh, of you know, media outlets that he has been on, and he's also been a commentator on other radio shows. He uh, contributes regularly to Dig Boston, and he's written for Esquire, Boston Magazine, Bullet Media, and Revolver. Okay. He lives in Dorchester with his wife, Jessica, and their children, Danielle and Jackson. And you can follow him on Twitter at, David, at Dave Wedge. So this is quite an event. You know everybody's been following the trial, and, uh, you know, it's... Uh, very immediate to all of us. And so we're very, very proud to have David Wedge speak with us. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it for that wonderful introduction. Um, this one here. Uh, first of all, hi, Mrs. Roberts. How are you? Nice to see you. It's, it's nice to be here. You know, this is, a, you know, this book has been quite a journey for me and um, this is my f second event in Brockton since the book came out, and it makes me very proud because you know I'm from here, and uh, I always I live in Boston. I've lived in Boston now. I actually figured it out the other day. I've lived in Boston the same amount of time that I actually lived in Brockton, but I'll always consider myself as being from Brockton. When people ask me where I'm from, I say Brockton, not Boston. But um, soon enough, like next year, I'll have actually lived in Boston longer than Brockton, but. Uh, it's my hometown, so it's it's so nice to be here and uh, and have all of you here, and it's nice the Brockton Library to have me. So, as as uh, as she mentioned, I, I was a reporter at the Boston Herald for 14 years. Uh, graduate of Brockton High School, 1988. I did not get in much trouble, Dr. Applin. I stayed out of trouble in Brockton anyway. Got in trouble after Brockton, but no trouble in Brockton. So. Um, and I went to Boston College and uh, had a lot, actually a lot of friends of mine from Brockton High went, went to BC with me. So we kind of had the city councilor, uh, Bob Sullivan, is a good friend of mine. And that's the other Brockton event that I, that I did since the book came out was Bob actually had me up to the city council to, uh, he, he made a little proclamation uh, in honor of the book. So that was real nice. And that was, again, another very proud moment for me. So. Um, so I, I worked, I started, I, I graduated Bar, uh, Brockton High in 88, went to Boston College, and when I got out of there, I, I had an English degree. I was an English major at, at Boston College. Really didn't know what I wanted to do, and I, um, I had a, a friend who was an editor down at the Taunton Gazette, so I had done a little writing for the Boston College student newspaper, and I said, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, I was just working at like a sub shop, and I was like, I'll start doing some writing, and so I started doing some part-time sports writing for them. And I kind of kept moving up, and they eventually had me start covering some like town meetings and things like that. And I eventually um, was hired as the Taunton Gazette's crime reporter. And I did that for about four years, and then I moved along to the, uh, to the Attleboro newspaper. And then I actually took a leave, and I taught high school English at Brockton High School for a year in, in the mid-90s. Um, and I, I loved that, but uh, the journalism really kept calling me back. So. I uh, ultimately I got a tryout at the Herald and I, I got the job and I started there in 1999 and I, uh, I was a general assignment news reporter for my first five or six years and uh, one of the first big stories I covered was the Worcester fire in 1999 with the, uh, the six firefighters passed away and so I was kind of you know thrown right to the wolves it was like my third or fourth week on the job and suddenly I was covering this national story and I learned you learn pretty quick when you're at a place like the Herald where you know the competition is fast and furious and you have to really 
be accurate and fast. So you learn quickly that you either have it or you don't. And I saw a lot of people crash and burn and leave pretty quickly the business. And but I liked it, and I and I and I stuck with it. And I had a great career at the Herald. I ended up I, I as as was mentioned I um I was sent down to ground zero on the morning of 9-11 right after the first plane hit my boss called me I was I was actually in the middle of doing a investigative series about a cult down in Plymouth and I was getting ready for the day to to go uh, down there and my boss said the plane hit the World Trade Center the plane was out of Boston why don't you get going so I, I drove down and got to ground zero shortly after the buildings came down and I was in the middle of all that uh, kind of chaos and destruction and um, like all of us, it was life-changing for me, and um, I spent about two, two and a half weeks down there just reporting from ground zero, and I went back many times throughout the next couple of years for anniversaries and events and things like that, and um, it was quite a, quite a learning experience. So after that, we had the station fire. I covered a lot of that, and um, there's a lot of, you guys read the Herald, so there's a lot of murder, death, mayhem, and chaos in between all of that. But those were like kind of the landmark things in my career that really uh, will always stick with me as, as being the things that I'll remember the most. And so after that, I kind of was burned out from covering that sort of uh, breaking news and all the grim kind of stuff. And I decided uh, to join the political team at the Herald, and I became the Herald City Hall reporter, and then I became the State House Bureau Chief, and then I was City Hall Bureau Chief. and. Um, just one quick correction. I didn't cover Governor Weld. I'm not that old. I covered Governor Romney uh, and Governor Patrick, and I covered Mayor Menino, and then I covered the election of Mayor Walsh. And that was really when I decided it was time to move on. So April 15th, 2013, I'm the City Hall reporter at the Herald, and I'm getting ready to go to a meeting. And I was actually in my car on the way, and I got a call from a firefighter friend of mine and said something just happened, it was Marathon Monday, and someone said, uh, he said, a couple of explosions at the finish line, it doesn't sound good. And I, you know, I just said, well, you know, it's probably just manhole cover explosions or substation explosion. There was one a couple of weeks before, you may remember, where a substation blew up on Boylston Street, knocked power out to the whole neighborhood, and it was kind of a big story, so I was like, oh, that's probably nothing. I was wrong, unfortunately, and um, so I got sent to the finish line, and uh, I got there uh, shortly after the explosions, and I did my reporting, and I wrote a bunch of stories for that day, and covered it all through the week, and I was I was there uh, when President Obama was in town covering all that stuff, and that Thursday night after the president was in town, uh, I had a late night at the Herald that night, and I got home probably around 10, 11 o'clock, and um, myself and my wife, we had a two-week-old son. He, my our son was born on March 29th, and I felt like, you know, they didn't know who these people were. They had just released the pictures. I said, you know, we have some time. It's going to take some time for him to find him. And I finally got to relax. My wife is on maternity leave. She's a columnist at the Herald. Uh, her name is Jessica Heslam. And um, finally sat down for a few minutes, took the baby in my arms, and started to try to fall asleep and I had the news on and I saw that Sean Collier had been shot, the police officer at MIT. And I, just the reporter in me knew that something wasn't right about it and I, I just handed the baby back to Jessica and I said, I, I gotta go. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, it's, it's gotta be connected to this. And so I got in my car, started heading to MIT and as I was on my way there, my boss called and said, there's something going on in Watertown and gave me the intersection. He said, go to the corner of Dexter and Laurel Street in Watertown. There's a shootout going on. They're throwing bombs at the police, and we don't really know what's going on, but there's some sort of huge firefight. So, um, you know, looking back, it kind of defies logic, but it was, I, I sped my car towards the chaos. So that's what we do in my business. And so I got there uh, just as the shootout was ending. When I got there, pretty much... Um, it was obviously a very chaotic scene. The, the smoke was just clearing. People running all around, police officers running, guns out, you know, cars speeding all over the place. It was pretty intense, probably the most, in, definitely the most intense thing I ever experienced in my career um, that night and when I first got to Manhattan on 9-11 were the two things that, probably the most, you know, most 
scared, frankly, that I ever was on my job and, and the most uh, really uh, confused. It was very confusing what was going on because at that time in Watertown, if you remember, um, we knew they were looking for two people, but we didn't know if they were working with other people. So, And we knew they were throwing bombs at the police. So there was a real serious concern there of are there other bombs? Did they activate a cell? Where are they? Are they on the trains? Are they, you know, do they have other attacks planned? So it was a very uncertain time. And um, I ended up staying there through the night and, uh, and through the next night until they actually caught him. And, and during that time, um, I, she mentioned my Twitter, and I was very active on Twitter, and I was tweeting my location and trying to get it, because I was out there trying to get information from Twitter as well as provide it. And um, throughout that time, when I, I go back now and look at the tweets from that time, it was just, it's amazing like how little information we had out there. We really didn't know anything that was going on. We had no idea where these guys were. The police clearly didn't have much information. And we would just be hanging out on, on a street corner, you know, there was maybe about 10 or 15 media there. And then like neighbors, just people would come out of their houses and the cops would tell them to go back in. And they would keep us in certain areas. And every now and then, they would just yell at us. The National Guard would come running towards us and say, move on, move to the next block, run, run, run. And they would push, push us off to the next block. And then they would cordon it off and would stay there. And then the house where we were just standing, they would go in with machine guns and dogs and they were searching these houses one by one. And what I later learned was they were acting on tips of people calling and they were trying to figure out where this kid was. So long story short, stayed there through the night and uh, they eventually caught him and as bad as the scene was in Watertown and as confusing as it was when I when they caught him that was probably one of the proudest moments I've ever seen in Boston and, and even America it was just sheer joy and jubilation people were high-fiving and the police cars were were had their sirens blaring and the firefighters were chanting USA uh, uh, through the loudspeakers and um, Watertown Square was really just like a big street party. People were celebrating, and the city that night in general was was very uh, it was it was it was an exciting uh, time. People, I think, felt very uh, very uh, proud of the job that the first responders did in catching those guys. So, flash forward to the book. So, I always wanted to do a book, and uh, but I never really found the right topic that was really um, worth my time, something that I wanted to invest a year or more of my life into on top of doing my job. Um, I almost did a book about the Entwistle murder case, the one in Hopkinton. I, I ended up working on that book. I was the editor on it, but I didn't actually write it because uh, it wasn't just a, it wasn't a story that I really wanted to write. So um, on 9-11, I, I, I met a police officer named Chris Hunt in he was working at uh, Ground Zero. He was in the first precinct, which is the precinct closest to Ground Zero. That's their territory, and he was on patrol that day. And during those days I was down at 9-11, we became friends, and we've stayed in touch ever since. He's now a really good friend of mine. We talk all the time. We text and all this stuff. And when the bombs went off on uh, Marathon Monday, the first text I got from someone was from Chris. He saw it on the news, and he texted me, and he said, are you okay? I said, yeah, and he said, take good notes. You're going to write a book about this. And um, I didn't really think too much about it because I was in the middle of doing my job, but I took his advice, and I took very detailed notes, more so than I would have otherwise. Um, and I ended, those notes ended up becoming very important to the book um, because they were my firsthand observations of what happened um, throughout that whole week. And, and it was I was right in the middle of it all. It was... As the City Hall reporter, I had a front seat to it because I was with Mayor Menino every day. So I was at all those press conferences when Mayor Menino checked himself out of the hospital. I was right there with him. I traveled with him to the church, and I got, got a lot of pretty exclusive access. So a few weeks go by after they caught uh, the terrorists, and I, uh, my, my co-author, Casey Sherman, he was a former uh, producer for Channel 4, and he had written seven books, and he got in touch with me and said, listen, I'm thinking about doing a book on the marathon bombings, and I need someone to do it with. Would you be interested? And I was kind of thinking about doing it anyway. So I said, yeah, absolutely. So we got together and started, um, started working on it. And it was a, it was a, a, a fantastic partnership because uh, Casey's 
um, just a, a gifted storyteller. He's, his last book is a book called The Finest Hours, which is about a famous Coast Guard rescue off the coast of uh, Chatham in the 1950s. And Disney actually just filmed that and made it into a, a big budget Hollywood movie, and it's coming out in January. So my boots on the ground reporting combined with his storytelling, I think really um, was a good partnership to, to do this because it's such a big story. You know, you had four people killed, you had 268 people injured, and you had all the, um, you know, uncertainty and uh, all the drama that was unfolding around the city all at once. So there was a, a million stories to tell. And if we could have written this book um, to be a thousand pages, we could have. There's, you know, to this day, at all events like this, someone inevitably comes up to me um, that ran the marathon that day or had a relative that did or had a friend that was there. And we just continue to be overwhelmed mm -hmm. with the amount of stories. And really, that's what uh, the spirit of the book is. It's like the marathon is, um, in my opinion, it's, it's the quintessential Boston day. It's winter's over, spring's here, everybody finally gets outside to witness the triumph of human spirit. People run this race and, you know, of all ages, genders, colors, sizes, ethnic backgrounds, they come from all over the world, 130 different countries are represented that day, and they all run 26 miles, and it's, I'm never ceased to be amazed by, by, uh, by the race. So, um, th this, you know, we really wanted to write this book about not just what happened. We tell the story of what happened, but we really wanted you to get to know some of the people um, that were impacted by it, some of the folks that survived, some of the people that saw it, some of the heroes and some of the first responders, and, um, and, uh, and, and also some of the relatives of the folks who passed away. One of the, uh, I think one of the most, inter a lot of people ask us, well, if I read the book, what, what am I going to learn in there that I don't already know? And I think what you, one of the best things I think that you'll learn in there is you'll learn about, a lot about Sean Collier. His family spent a lot of time with us, and we sat down with that family for several hours in the summer after the bombings happened and the shooting, the execution of Sean Collier. And Casey and I went to their house up in Wilmington, and, and we walked in, and his whole family was there. There was about uh, 12 of them. He comes from like a Brady Bunch type of family where both parents are divorced and had kids from previous marriages. They got together. Uh, the kids were relatively young, so they all grew up together in this kind of Brady Bunch house. And it's, it's funny, Sean and his brother were these two little, they're about the same age, and they were just like two peas in a pod, and they loved to race go-karts. And they, they, uh, they built soapbox derby stuff, and then they did go-karts, and then when they got older, they got into formula racing up in New Hampshire. And now the younger brother, Andrew, is actually on a pit crew for NASCAR. He works um, for, I think it's... Um, Hoyt or one of one of them. I am not a race car guy, but he works for one of them. And um, so we sat down with the family, and they and Casey said to them, he said, "Listen, we we know about Sean, the police officer. We want to know about Sean, the brother, Sean, the son, Sean, the kid." And what you'll read in the pages of our book is what I think is a pretty incredible account of a young man who dedicated his life to public service from a very young age someone that knew what he wanted to do from really the time he was a child. He, he w always wanted to be a police officer. And um, the irony of the situation with Sean Collier is that he shouldn't have been there that night. He was supposed to be working for a different police department, but he had already given his word to MIT. He had already said, yeah, I'll, I'll come work for you guys. Before he actually started that job, he was offered a job with another department. And he said, no, you know what? I appreciate it, but I can't. I've already committed to MIT. So he was a man of his word, and ultimately that ended up being uh, a fateful decision for him because he shouldn't have been there that night. Um, but you learn a lot about Sean Collier. You, you'll also learn a, a lot about survivors that maybe you didn't, you haven't heard about. Uh, someone like Michelle LaRue. Uh, Michelle is a young woman from Maine. She's uh, turning 40 on Saturday, and she's not a runner, but her boyfriend runs the race every year, Brian, and he has run 10 marathons. Michelle never went to the finish line. She doesn't like crowds. She used to go watch them up in Chestnut Hill or other places away from Boylston Street. But this year, it was his 10th one, and her friends was, said, let's go make a day of it. Let's have some fun. So 
she decided to go, and again, another fateful decision. She was at Marathon Sports with some friends, and right before the bombs went off, she had posted a picture on Facebook uh, directly in front of Marathon Sports, holding up a sign, uh, cheering on Brian. And Brian ran by her, and she yelled to him. He ran over, and he gave her a kiss, said, I love you, and he kept running. He crossed the finish line, and a few minutes later, the bombs went off. And as he was walking to get dressed up, uh, changed and everything. He, he heard the bomb go off and he didn't know what it was like a lot of people didn't. He thought it was a, a dump truck or you know a truck you know backfiring or something and uh, he when he ultimately tried to call Michelle someone told him it was a bomb he couldn't get in touch with her he, he started to worry and so Michelle uh, nearly lost her leg, nearly lost her arm, uh, had a lot of shrapnel in her body uh, severe hearing damage. She lost over 40% of her hearing permanent, will never come back. And um, she stumbled into marathon sports and fell down. And she's one of these people that you hear about all these heroic rescues. Three of these people that worked at the store, no medical training, they just, a couple of Adidas reps and a manager of marathon sports ran over to her, saw that she was in serious distress and started ripping t-shirts off, off the racks and ripping them into strips and tied tourniquets around her leg and her arm, and they saved her life. Um, the doctors told Michelle unequivocally that if those tourniquets were not on her body, she, she would have bled out and she would have died right there on the floor. And now we have this trial going on, um, and several, of the, I don't know how much you guys have been following the trial, if you've been looking at the pictures and the evidence, but there's a lot of video, and that's something that's really astounded me. We didn't have access to this video before the book. I wish we did but we're gonna update the book going forward with some new uh, information from the trial uh, in the next few months. But everything is on tape. Pretty much everything that happened from the time Joe Carr, son Ive, and his brother walked to Boylston Street, to the actual bombings, to their escape from Boylston Street, to what Joe Carr, son Ive did after the bombings. He went to a store and bought milk, um, to Watertown, is, video of everything it's it's amazing the video the actual bombing at marathon sports you can watch it it's on video and michelle's in it you watch that video and i actually watched it with michelle and she said there i am and she saw herself cut walking in and uh the funny thing about these sort of things is you know your mind plays tricks on you in these tense situations you know uh she told us that she thought she thought she wandered around the streets for five minutes after the bomb went off, and she thought she walked a block to get to wherever she fell. It was about 10 seconds. The bomb goes off, and you see it on the video. You see a flash, the window breaks, and one woman runs in, another woman runs in, and then Michelle runs in and falls down. And it's, it's really just uh, incredible to, to see how the, the mind plays tricks on you, that she didn't even know what happened to her. Um, so the trial now is, is entering the, uh, the death penalty phase and I've, I've covered a lot of court in my life and I, I've been sitting in the trial a lot of days, not every day. Casey and I have kind of been taking turns uh, going in and out, um, but I've never seen um, testimony and evidence as heartbreaking and intense as what is being shown in Boston right now. It's, it's, I can't imagine what that jury's going through with the, the, and the families. And these families are sitting there every day listening to this, and the kid's sitting right there. And a lot of people ask us, you know, what's he like? What does he look like? Well, you know, I can tell you from being in the courtroom that, you know, while I don't know what is, what's in his heart, I can see from his mannerisms that he doesn't seem to care. And he actually seems to kind of, kind of a little bit, enjoy the proceedings. He's not laughing, but he's kind of a little smug. And, um, you know, some people have described him to me as, as you know, he looks like a kid that, that was dragged to a job interview he didn't want to be at. And that's a good description of him, because that's what he looks like. He's kind of wearing a suit that doesn't really fit him, and he's kind of got a smug look on his face. And this evidence is just being paraded in front of this jury. They're just being bombarded with amputees and, you know, the Richard family, and, and it's just one thing after the other. And um, the survivors tell us that they're, they're very happy that they convicted him. They're happy they convicted him of all 30 charges. They're happy that he'll never see the light of day again. But they're very split on the death penalty. And my opinion is that this case is going to end up being a referendum on the death penalty in this country. 
Um, if you don't give the death penalty to this kid, why have it? Why have it as a law? But we're in Massachusetts, and it's going to be really tough for 12 people to agree on giving someone the death penalty. We're not a death penalty state. And I, I think they'll probably give it to them, but I won't be surprised if they don't. And if they don't, I think it's going to ignite a debate in this country as to whether or not we should even have the death penalty. Um, because it's, uh, again, like I said, it's, you know, they gave it to Tim McVeigh. They, they, they gave it to Gary Sampson. Um, it's happened in federal court in, in Massachusetts, Gary Sampson being the most recent one. But maybe if we don't, if they don't give it in this case, maybe as a society we're moving away from that. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that's where I think the debate will go. That's kind of my, my read on it. So with that, I'm going to, uh, I'll take some questions if anyone has some questions. Officer Landry. Good afternoon, Dave. How are you? Thank you. I appreciate that very much. It's nice of you. Mr. Sarantopoulos. No, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> keep, it, keep it clean, please. I will. Don't worry. Uh, what, if anything, did you take away from the book? From the book? Yeah. Well, uh, as you'll find, I, I don't know if Pete has provided you with a copy no. yet or not. But no. I, you I know, when, buy it mine tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, I, th I think when you read it, you're going to there's going to be some parts that are tough to read, you know, and, and Mayor Walsh actually wrote the foreword of the book, and he says that. He says there's going to be things that you're going to read in this book that are difficult to read. Well, it was very difficult to write. It was very difficult to, to listen to this. You know, I, I, I've spent a career uh, speaking with victims and survivors of horrible, horrible tragedies. I mean, a lot of bad stuff I, I've, I've seen in my career, you know, um, but nothing to this level. And so I, as with 9-11, I, I will take with me from this experience um, an incredible respect for the humility and the grace that the people involved in this have carried themselves with, especially during this trial. You know, to watch someone like Bill Richard, whose son was literally ripped in half in front of him, eight years old, his daughter loses her leg, his wife is blind in one eye, and his other son sitting there watching in horror. He, meanwhile, has lost his hearing, bleeding, burned, smoking, doesn't know what's going on, and he has to sit while this kid's sitting 10 feet away from him, and they show the pictures of his son, his son's clothes that he was wearing that day, his little Celtic shirt ripped, burned. Um, for me, that is Boston Strong. That spirit that, you know, I know my dad and I know you would jump over that banister and strangle the kid. The fact that he didn't do that is a strength that I don't even understand. So that's what I'll take from the whole experience, is, is that strength. And, and then again, people like Michelle LaRue and Heather Abbott is another one that you'll read about. She lost her leg. Um, she lives down in Newport, Rhode mm -hmm. Island. Amazing woman. She just launched a charity for amputees. Um, not just amputees from the marathon, but all amputees. And again, you know, her charity, is, it's, it's, it's amazing the good that can come out of these type of situations. Um, she said, look, I'm fine. I got money from the one fund and I've gotten prosthetic legs donated to me by these, you know, medical device companies that just, I'm a high profile victim so they know they can test out new products with me. These legs cost anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and, and someone like Jane Richard is going to need at least ten if not twenty of those throughout her life. She's going to need one to run. She's going to need one to swim. She's going to need uh, just a regular walking one. And when she gets older, if she wants to wear skirts and dresses and wear, wear heels and, and lead a normal life that she wants to lead, she's going to need special legs for that. And they outgrow them. Your, your limb swells and, and rescinds over the course of your life, and they get uncomfortable. The technology is getting better where they, have, um, they actually retract and they kind of grow with you, but they don't last forever. I'm told that some of them only last like three to five years. So Heather starts this charity for amputees. Uh, anybody, you know, all these people that lose limbs and car accidents and disease and stuff like that. So her point, her point is, you know, all of us in the marathon, we're going to be okay. The government's helping us and society and all these companies. But, you know, if I was in a car accident and lost my leg, I wouldn't have any help. And your insurance only covers the bare bones, one basic limb. And it's, and it's not the best one. It's much like glasses. When you go to get glasses, they give you the cheapest 
glasses is covered. If you want a nice pair of glasses, you have to pay for that. It's the same with the lens. So um, my point of that is that uh, that strength that these people found in the face of a horrible uh, tragedy, and they're, you know, Heather Abbott's got to learn how to live on her own. She's a single woman with one leg. She's got to learn how to bring her groceries in from the car. And she had the presence of mind and, and, the, and the, the fortitude to come up with something that charitable. To me, again, that's, that's what Boston Strong's all about. It really is. Sure. Anyone else? Hi. Yeah, can, can you talk about what organizations the brothers were connected to, what terrorist organizations the brothers were connected to? Sure. Well, we, we do. So we made a conscious decision in writing the book that we didn't want it to be about the Sarnayev brothers. Someone else will write that book. And I guess I understand there is a book out now about them that was written from like interviews with people that know them. but. We do give a lot about their background because in talking to the survivors uh, that we've been become close with, they express to us that they want to know as much detail as they can about them. That said, we didn't want to make it about them, but we tell a lot of the background. And I think in answer to your question, I don't think there's a formal group. The bottom line is they're uh, radical jihadists. They're extremists. They're Muslim extremists. Um, they follow the same sort of uh, misguided dogma that you saw with the 9-11 hijackers, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, and the rest of them. Um, they did, uh, Tamerlan Sanayev did travel to Chechnya three months before the bombings, and he kind of went off the, ch off the radar for a couple of months, and the uh, investigators believe that he trained with uh, radical jihadists over there, the same folks that were involved in a string of bombings in Chechnya. Uh, Dagestan is a war-torn region and it's largely like the Middle East where it's um, re religious extremists versus uh, you know mainstream society and uh, those bombings over there, it, one of them involved the bombing of a school and um, some of the bombings that they were involved in were eerily similar to what happened in Boston so it's clear that they trained with terrorist organizations. And the other thing I'll say is um, they did uh, uh, subscribe to Inspire Magazine, which is the Al Qaeda handbook. It, it, it's online. It's called Inspire Magazine. You can go on there and read all about how to be a jihadist. And the instructions for the bombs that they made came from Inspire Magazine. Really? Oh. And and the the bombs that were used in Boston were exactly like the bombs that were used in London. When the remember when the Loop was bombed in London. Uh, Ed Davis, the Boston Police Commissioner, told us as soon as he saw what happened on Boylston Street, he, after the London bombings, Ed Davis went over to London to train and, and learn. Because when these terrorist attacks happen in major cities, law enforcement leaders from other cities go, you know, like Boston, New York, LA, Miami, they'll go to learn so they can see how these other cities handle it and see what they might have to deal with someday. Ed Davis went and what he saw in Boston, he told us, was exactly the same type of weapons that we used in London. They were uh, anti-personnel devices, is what they refer to them as. They're just like the IEDs that are on the roadsides in Afghanistan and Iraq. They're packed with uh, BBs, nails, things like that, sometimes even glass. They use very easy to get uh, triggers, such as toy remote controls, cell phones. In Boston, they, they used toy remote control uh, remotes and uh, gunpowder that you can get in fireworks. And they bought the gunpowder for theirs in New Hampshire. Hi, Mrs. Roberts. Do you have a movie in the works? We, we do. So tw I don't personally, I'm not personally making the movie, but uh, 20th Century Fox has bought the rights to our book. And um, it's in development right now. Uh, where we're at in the process is they're finishing up the final version of the script. And there's a producer and a director. And once that script is finished, they'll cast it. And 20th Century Fox is a, it's, it's a pretty big priority movie project for them, we're told. So um, the thing with that is, you know, a lot of people have asked us, you know, isn't it too soon? You know, do we really need a movie about this and that sort of stuff? You know, we saw it with 9-11. We saw it with Zero Doc 30. Um, my answer to that is, you know, if a, mo a movie's going to be made about this at some point, I would rather have it be based on my book and people that I'm working with that live here and care about Boston as opposed to just someone parachuting in from Hollywood and 
you know, turning it into a big budget action movie and showing gore and all that sort of stuff. So the script, the most recent version of the script that I saw is uh, it's, it's not really about the bombings, it's more about the manhunt. So it's about the investigation and the capture. There is a bombing scene because that's what it's, you know, that's what happened. But it's not, you know, it's not about the bombing. And, it, and it's, it'll be heavily character driven. You'll get to know the people from our book, which is what I like. Yeah. Well, we are we are consultants on it, and that was part of the deal that we made with them. We said we want to remain co consultants on it. There's also uh, the head of the Boston Police Homicide Unit, that Danny Keeler, that's one of the big folks that spoke to us for the book. He's a consultant on the film as well. So we hope that between all of us, and then one of the producers is a woman named Dorothy Aferio, who is actually from Watertown, and she lives in the neighborhood where the shootout happened. So she has a vested interest too. Uh, if it's terrible, she's going to hear it from her neighbors, you know. Um, and uh, and also these folks that we're working with, they made The Fighter, which was a Boston movie made in Lowell, and they also made The Finest Hours, which is Casey's movie about the Coast Guard from Chatham. So we feel like there's a good contingent of Boston people that really care about the city. That, so hopefully all of us, so far, I'm very pleased with the way the process has gone. Um, and I, I just, I think they're responsible filmmakers. I mean, 20th Century Fox knows this is sensitive stuff. The last thing they want to do is anger, um, you know, anybody. But all that said, there's going to be people that are just flat out think it's wrong to make a movie about this. And I respect that opinion, just like I do about the 9-11 ones. I mean, me personally, I haven't been able to watch the 9-11 movies. I never watched United 93. I never watched World Trade Center because it's, it's too upsetting to me because I was there, you know. So I, I'm sure that a lot of the survivors will feel the same about this one. So, hi. Do you have any insight as to why the Zainayev brothers chose not to kill themselves in the bombing? Like so many jihad, other jihadists self um, inflicted killings? Yeah, I, I do actually. So their original plan was to, was to bomb um, uh, the Esplanade on the 4th of July. Their original plan was to, was to bring the bombs there and set them off during the 4th of July fireworks. But what happened was they learned how to make the bombs faster than they thought they could. And the bombs were ready sooner. So they said, you know what, let's do the marathon instead. And their plan was to bomb the marathon and then go to New York and bomb Times Square. So the night of uh, Watertown, they, were actually, they had those bombs in their car, investigators believe, because they were on their way to Times Square to, to, to commit an attack down there and, and blow them up there. Uh, not, not as far as we know of. I mean, they didn't have suicide jackets, which is what a lot of the Al Qaeda jihadists wear. You know, they wear the, the jackets with the <coughs> bombs strapped to them. They just had uh, your garden variety so I IEDs. They I well, I think that, but I think they also thought, you know, they were going to get away with it and they could commit more atrocities. I think. Yeah. And the reason they killed Sean Collier was because they needed a gun. And they ended up not even be able, being able to get his gun. They couldn't figure out how to get it out of the holster. Hi, Mrs. Uh, Trask. How are you? Are there still sympathizers for the brothers outside the courtroom? Uh, the, the, there's now a lot of anti-death penalty folks there, but the free Jahar crowd that was around is kind of dissipated because um, he admitted he did it. His, his, the first thing his defense lawyer said in, in the in the opening statement of the trial was, he did it. Yeah, that's him. He did it, but his brother made him do it. That's their argument. And so I think once they acknowledged that he did it, all those people, they realized they were fools. They realized that, you know, there was a lot of people that thought he was framed and thought he was an innocent kid. And, you know, it was, it was ridiculous, really. I mean, it's all, like I said, it's all caught on tape. So, um, no, there's not, not too many of them there. But the anti-death penalty folks are there, and they're pretty vocal. And there has been a few instances where some of the survivors and, and victims' families have kind of, um, I don't want to say got into it, but kind of interacted with them in not such a pleasant way. <coughs> I, uh, what about Tamalyn's wife? So Tamalyn's wife was a Rhode Island girl. She went to URI, and he met her in a nightclub in Boston. Uh, her name's Catherine Russell. And Catherine's mother took the stand yesterday in the trial, 
and it's the first time we've really heard from her. She's been underground. No one's spoken to her. We tried extensively, but we had no luck reaching her or finding her. Um, you know, what the mother says is that, you know, the family was very uncomfortable with their relationship, thought he was like uh, kind of a, you know, uh, a bad influence on her and, um, and that he was, you know, getting increasingly radical. The thing that concerns me with that is they're trying to draw the narrative that he was like almost like a cult, like he was the leader. And they're going to try to pin it. The defense strategy is to pin it all on him. It's like, yeah, he did it, but his, his brother made him do it. He was scared of his brother. And by the mom saying that about, you know, the family, that the family was uncomfortable with him, it kind of helps along that narrative. So I hope it's a strategy that doesn't work. Anything else? I Has the family from Raja gone on the stand yet? Um, no, not yet. I'm not sure who's here. And, and I actually don't know what happened today. I'm, I, I didn't check in today. But um, I know that some of... The brother's family is here, and they're they're gonna they're gonna be put on the stand. It's not the mother though, and I don't believe it's the father. Uh, the mother's wanted on warrants for shoplifting. She actually uh, she's she's a piece of work. She stole twelve hundred dollars worth of merchandise from the Natick collection, and then she defaulted on her court cases. So she's got warrants. So if she comes back to America. She'll she'll be arrested. In addition to that. Um, I got to think she's on a on a terrorist watch list at this point because after the convictions she put out a statement to the Russian media saying that America will pay for my sons. That's a direct quote. So, I would imagine that um that the 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 FBI and the and the the border patrol and customs have will not I mean, I think she'll be taken into immediate custody if she ever tried to get into America. Hi. I mean, yeah, that's possible, I think. You know, um, you know, one thing that happened after Oklahoma City in, in 1994 when Tim McVeigh bombed the Alfred Murrah Federal Building, killing over 200 people, um, they started to put regulations on how much fertilizer you could buy. So now FBI people that I know tell me, you know, because I ask all the time, like, why don't these bombings happen all the time? You know, why? it's so easy to do. They said because if someone goes into a Home Depot and buys an inordinate amount of fertilizer and isn't a contractor, like a landscaper or something like that, a registered contractor, they're flagged. It's much like when you go into CVS and you try to buy 10 packs of Sudafed, you can't get it because they use it to make crystal meth. Yes. So same thing, maybe they will with the gunpowder, maybe that will start to happen. It, it probably should. Um, you know, I know that the, you, you know, the Massachusetts state troopers around the 4th of July sit at the ma at the border and they they do grab people coming over with tons of fireworks and everyone you know makes fun of it like oh leave them alone leave them alone but I don't think they're really looking for like guys that are lighting off bottle rockets at cookouts I think they're looking for people that are going to make bombs yeah, fireworks they're not no. no and you just saw last week there was a kid in Norwell that um, had a bunch of bomb I think it was Norwell or Norwood one of the others and he had a bunch of bomb making materials in his car and his his car blew up he blew himself up so i think that's the kind of stuff that they're looking for hey gary how are you doing dude? Hi. anything else well thank you all so much it's nice to be here I appreciate it.